Welcome everyone to our solar photovoltaic course. Today we are having 6th week, 5th module. Now in our 6th week lectures, we are discussing about a very important technology of solar cell that is perovskite solar cell. And so far if you remember, we have discussed about the perovskite solar cell, how to fabricate a perovskite solar cell and some of the parameters related to the stability of the perovskite solar cell. Now I mentioned that that perovskite solar cell, uh, this is very very interesting materials for study because its efficiency is very very high and the material cost is low. But while discussing in terms of stability, we, we have seen that the morphology plays a very important role in determining the stability of these devices. Now what do we mean by the morphology? So by morphology we mean a uniform pinhole free continuous thin film. So what will happen if we have a lot of pinholes? Now these pinholes are defect states or trap states. So if there are a lot of pinholes or the defect or trap states in the systems, then those defect states or trap states work like a potential energy minimum and that can lead to the electron hole recombination. So in an ideal case, we should have as minimum or as small number of defect states in the systems. Now this is achieved by a slightly different fabrication approach by changing the perovskite bulk material to perovskite single crystal solar cell. We will see that perovskite single crystal has a much less number of defect states and nowadays it has been extensively used for making not only for solar cell but also for making different kind of photoreactors as well as the light emitting diode. So today we will discuss about the perovskite single crystals. So what is single crystal? A single crystal or monocrystalline solid is a material in which the crystal lattice of the entire sample is continuous and unbroken to the edge of the sample with no grain boundaries. Okay. So let us say this is an amorphous material, let us say I have an, a chalk in my hand, chalk which we use for writing in the board. So chalk is an example of a amorphous material, there is no symmetry in the crystal structure. Now if you put a crystal structure symmetry, so if you have the a periodic arrangement of the lattice point which is arranged by the atoms of the motifs, then we will get a periodic lattice. Now this periodic structure can be such that it is a continuous and unbroken to the edge of the sample like single crystal or it can be not continuous and the same pattern is not followed everywhere like a polycrystalline material. For example, like you know let us say I have these two square box I have drawn, now the, both of them are a crystalline material but one of the material has lot of crystal grains here. So if there are many crystal grains then there will be lot of these grain boundaries are there. In another case the whole this rectangle is filled by one circle like that or one domain size like that. So this is a single crystal, this is a polycrystalline material. So the crystalline material can be further polycrystalline or a single crystalline material. Single crystal material is continuous and unbroken to the edge of the samples with no grain boundaries. You can start the single crystal material or we can fabricate the perovskite single crystal material starting with our common perovskite source MABBI3 also. And this is this figure is an example of perovskite single crystal which is made from the MABBI3. And we have put it on a graph paper to show you that the dimension of the perovskite single crystal. You can see that this scale bar, this yellow line from here to here is 5 millimeter and this crystal is from here to here, this is quite large, it is almost 8 millimeter along the length and this phase are 100 phase or 112 phase, these are the Miller indices of the crystal structure. So single crystal, they have a high degree of order, they have a unique properties, very often it is different from their bulk counterpart, no grain boundaries, so usually they do not have a grain boundaries and absence of the defects. We expect the number of trap states or defect states is much much small in comparison to a polycrystalline bulk counterpart. So single crystalline materials obviously offer us some advantage in terms of the degree of crystallinity, high degree of order, no grain boundaries, if there is no grain boundaries since perovskite has a free charge carrier dynamics, so the charge carrier can easily be collected, so it can give a high efficiency and as well as unique properties. Like all other crystal growth, perovskite single crystal growth also follow two step, one is nucleation, another is the growth. We will discuss about the two different phase. What is nucleation? 
the nucleation is the initial process that occurs in the formation of a crystal form a solution. A liquid or a vapor in which a small number of ions, atoms or molecules become arranged in a pattern characteristics of a crystalline solid forming a site upon which additional particles are deposited as the crystal grows. So, basically this is a seed forming phenomena. We start from a solution liquid or vapor in which a small number of ions, atoms or molecules become arranged in a pattern and that pattern will be characteristics of the crystalline solid forming a site upon which additional particle can be deposited in the next stage for the crystal growth. Second stage is the crystal growth, the physical process by which a new phase increase in size. In the case of solidification, this refers to the formation of a stable solid particle as the liquid freeze. Growth of crystal from solution can occur if some degree of super saturation or super cooling has been achieved first in three steps. Achievement of super saturation or super cooling, formation of crystal nuclei, successful growth of crystals to get distinct phase. So, there are three steps one is the achievement of the super saturation or super cooling, then the crystal nuclei is formed, and finally, on top of the crystal nuclei, the growth of the crystal starts. Super saturation is a state of solution that contains more of the dissolved material than that could be dissolved by the solvent under normal circumstances. For example, let us say I have a glass of water and I want to dissolve sugar in it. So, you pour one teaspoon full of sugar into one glass of water, 250 ml glass of water. Okay. So, the sugar will be dissolved completely in the water, you stir it with a spoon. Now, let us say you wanted to dissolve some more sugar into it. So, you add two or three more teaspoons full of the sugar, so it will be dissolved. But, but let us say you wanted to dissolve 500 gram of sugar in 250 ml of water. So, then what will happen? So, you can there will be a limit until which you can keep on dissolving the sugar and beyond that That's particular limit if you add even one more grain of sugar molecule all the sugar will come outside the solution. Now, that critical stage you reached that is called the super saturation. So, at the normal temperature when the solution is keeping or dissolving the maximum amount of solute inside it then it is a super saturation condition. Crystallization is actually the simultaneous process of the nucleation followed by the crystal growth. First there is a nucleation and which is followed by the crystal growth and the driving force is super saturation. Saturated solution, super saturated solution, unsaturated solution and crystal growth. So, there are four different condition is there. In a saturated solution the concentration C is equal to the critical concentration C. Critical concentration means that is the maximum amount of the solute you can dissolve in the solution beyond which if you even add one particular grain of the sugar molecule all the sugar will come outside the water that is your super saturation condition that is your critical concentration. Now, the concentration C if it is equal to the critical concentration then you have a saturated solution. When C greater than C, it is a super saturated solution, when C less than C, it is an unsaturated solution and crystal growth does not occur unless C greater than C. So, basically we need to have a super saturated solution to get a crystal growth. Now, this nucleation that can be categorized either as a homogeneous nucleation or a heterogeneous nucleation. We will discuss these two things in the next slide. So, homogeneous nucleation this is the nucleation without preferential nucleation sites is homogeneous nucleation. Homogeneous nucleation occurs when there are no special objects inside a phase which can cause nucleation. So, basically nucleation without preferential nucleation site that is the homogeneous nucleation. Homogeneous nucleation occurs spontaneously and randomly, but it requires super heating or super cooling of the medium. For example, you can look at this cartoon how we are forming the homogeneous nucleation in the figure. So, we have one molecule from there we get two, then we get three. So, this is going spontaneously and randomly and then we have made a cluster. Finally, we have a large crystal. So, starting from the one we get first two, then three, but when I come from two to three is there any preferential growth direction? No, 
the second circle has grown on the top of the first circle, but the third circle has grown just below this. And when we come to the fourth picture, this has grown randomly and this growth is also spontaneous. Finally, like you know, if everything like you know grows in a very random fashion, grows like this, then you call it as a homogeneous nucleations. Whereas, an heterogeneous nucleation that forms a preferential site such as phase boundaries, surface of containers, bottle, etcetera, or impurities like dust. So, they need some other substrate on which the heterogeneous nucleation can start. At such preferential sites, the effective surface energy is lower, thus diminish the free energy barrier and facilitating nucleation. So, whenever you have a prefer preferential site, the surface barrier energy is lower at those preferential sites. If the surface energy energy is lower, then the free energy barrier that prevents the nucleation to start that can be overcome and the nucleation process starts. So, all this nucleation and the growth process can also be described in terms of the phase diagram. Homogeneous nucleation occurs much more often, heterogeneous nucleation occurs much more often than homogeneous nucleation. So, in a heterogeneous nucleation, so we need a site to grow. Here there is a either an interface or grain boundary or a dust particle on which you see that particle has started growing, particle has started growing. Now, it has grown and finally, it has grown like this. So, this is very, very common. If we have a seed on which we wanted to grow our crystal, so we put the seed in a super saturated solution and we allow them to super cool or super heat. So, then according to the preferential site orientation, other like you know atoms or molecules or ion can grow on top of that there will be a preferred orientation or preferred directions of the growth and that you call as a heterogeneous nucleation and that is very, very common. For homogeneous nucleation, we do not need a preferential site. Now, let us look at this animation for the nucleation and the growth process. So, now I have the precursor solutions. From the precursor solutions, if the first nucleation happens, then we get a sites like this, the solid circle. And if you have a slow nucleation, then the number of sites is less than the first nucleation process. So, the nucleated site in the first nucleation, here you can see the solid blue circle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 we have drawn, but here we have drawn 1, 2, 3. So, the number of the nucleated sites in the slow nucleation is smaller than the first nucleation. Now, let us allow them both of them to grow. Another important difference, if you can look between the first nucleation and the slow nucleation, here the size distribution is smaller and random, here size distribution is larger and uniform. Why? Because you are doing a slow nucleation, you control the kinetics of the process. You allow enough time to the systems to undergo a small form equilibria state. So, then you have a better control over the size and the uniformity of the crystal orientation. Now, starting from the first nucleation, if I allow them to growth, so, basically what will happen, it will become larger and larger over the time and I will get a smaller particle. But from the slow nucleation, if we allow them to growth, so we will get a large particles. So, starting from the precursor solution, the first process is the nucleation. Nucleation is the growth of a pattern. It can be homogeneous or heterogeneous nucleation. And from the nucleated site, the growth starts. If I have a first nucleation, then the we will get a smaller particle. If I have a slow nucleation, we will have a larger particle. So, if I wanted to get a larger particles or large domain size in our crystal, then we should allow it for a slow nucleation. If we wanted to have a large number of small domain size, then we will allow the crystal for a first nucleation. So, mechanism of the crystallizations now summarize like the following. First, you have a super saturation, super saturation that leads to the nucleation, nucleation leads to the crystal growth and crystal growth leads to the crystal and finally, it leads to an equilibrium system. If there is no super saturation, then it will be non equilibria, finally, over the time it will also reach a equilibrium systems. So, these are the steps which is involved in the crystal growth process. First, you have a super saturated condition which can leads to the nucleation, which leads to the crystal growth, which leads to the crystal structure formation and it is a equilibrated structure. Keeping this general mechanism in mind, let us look at the growth mechanism and growth methods of the perovskite single crystal. Methods used to grow single crystals are classified by the growth environment and includes solid growth, 
liquid growth and vapor growth. Now, if you grow a perovskite crystals in a solid state, it is a solid growth. If you grow them in a liquid state, it is a liquid growth. If you grow them in a vapor phase, it is a vapor growth. All reported perovskite crystals have been re repaired with the liquid growth method. To produce perovskite single crystal, some of the popular methods which have been used in the literature are the slow cooling method, anti solvent precipitation method, and inverse temperature crystallization method or ITC. Let us discuss like you know these methods. In uh, slow cooling method, what we do here, we have been shown in this figure, some perovskite material solubility in an HX based solvent will decrease with a lower solution temperature. Following this basic principle, cooling the precursor can produce single crystal of perovskite materials. So, uh, basically what will happen like you know in this solvent, let I put CH3 lead iodide and I put lead iodide also as a precursor material. So, what will happen? So, if I cool it very, very slowly, so some of this compound their solubility will decrease. If the solubility decreases at low temperature, they will start forming the crystals like this. So, the slow cooling can also lead to the crystal formation. Anti solvent precipitation method as the name suggests, we have to use an anti solvent. Anti solvent means a solvent where the perovskite precursor does not dissolve. You look at this figure here, super saturation can be simplified realized by exposing a solution of the product to another solvent, anti solvent in which the product is sparingly soluble. So, we have a solution here in this beaker and then what we are doing? We are putting an anti solvent. Now, in anti solvent this material does not dissolve. So, this product is sparingly soluble in the anti solvent. So, what will happen after some time? Precipitation. Again precipitation will occur since the solubility of the desired product will be drastically reduced. So, whole the chamber has been sealed. So, first we dissolve the solution the precursor in a good organic solvent and then we slowly adding the anti solvent to this material. So, the solubility will be decreased of the precursor and it will get precipitated at the bottom surface and we can collect the crystals. So, this method is called the anti solvent preparation method. Then the ITC inverse temperature crystallization method. Large perovskite crystal can be quickly produced by increasing the temperature of the precursor solution which results from the abnormal solubility of the perovskite in these solvents. So, what happens like you know you take a perovskite solutions in an oil bath which is kept on a room temperature and you heat it. If you heat it, so basically what you will get a solution plus the crystal. This is called the inverse temperature crystallizations. Now, when I say that the single crystal shows some abnormal properties or some distinctive features in comparison to their bulk counterpart. So, what do we mean by those properties? You look in terms of the thin film and the single crystal in terms of its photoluminescence properties, PL stands for photoluminescence and in terms of the carrier lifetime. Now, if I look at the photoluminescence peak, the single crystal shows a photoluminescence peak at 820 nanometer, whereas a thin film shows at 805 nanometer. So, there is a red shifting happens. This red shifting can always or can be attributed to the less number of defects or trap states in the systems. What about the lifetime? What is lifetime? When you excite an electron to the ground state to the excited state, it can stay in the excited state for some time and after that it will relax back to the ground state. Now, the time it spends in the excited state that is the excited state lifetime. So, the lifetime has two components, one is the slow component, another is the fast component. A thin film perovskite solar cell has a lifetime in the order of 29 nanosecond and another lifetime is 227 nanosecond. Whereas, the perovskite single crystal has a lifetime of 32 nanosecond and 484 nanosecond. You look at this photoluminescence decay from this curve. This experiment is called transient decay experiment or femtosecond time dependent fluorescence decay. So, we have a femtosecond laser beam we excite the materials, we allow them to excite from the ground state to the excited state and then we are measuring the decay of the excited state, we are measuring the depopulation of the excited state and what we are plotting here the intensity count of the fluorescence versus the decay times. So, you can see that the, the PL decay for a slow component and a fast component is showing like this whether the total fit is like this. Now, if I if I take the total field like this this curve, so I can see there are two components here. I can draw one tangent here and I can draw one tangent here. 
So, this is tangent is the first component, this component is the slow component, which is here showing like you know there is two different lifetime components tau 1 and tau 2. But the lifetime is different in case of a thin film than a single crystal or in case of a polycrystalline material to a single crystal and also the fluorescence peak is different. So, what does it means that the radiation radiative recombination lifetime or the radiative recombination is different in these two different case. So, this is directly related to the trap state or the defect states in the systems. So, as we claim in the beginning that perovskite single crystal has a less number of trap state or less number of defect states in comparison to a polycrystalline counterpart that can be proved by doing this experiment. So, so far we discussed about a very interesting technology of the third generation solar cell which is believed to pick up as comparable to a silicon solar cell. The efficiency of this perovskite solar cell is very high 23 percent and this number is changing every day. This material has a number of important properties for example, a tunable band gap, a large absorption coefficient, good solubility. Because of that, we can make this kind of solar cell in a roll to roll basis on a flexible or printable substrate. We can tune the band gap in this material. So, that gives us the possibility of making a material which can absorb the light in the near IR range. And this material has a free charge carrier decay. So, that is the reasons we get a very high efficiency with the perovskite solar cell and we have also demonstrated you how to fabricate the perovskite solar cell or what is the device structure of a perovskite solar cell. Like all other sandwich device in perovskite solar cell the active material which is the perovskite material that has been sandwiched between a photo anode and cathode and to further enhance the charge carrier transport we usually put the transport layer electron transport layer and hole transport layer or the blocking layer electron blocking layer and hole blocking layer in the vicinity of the perovskite. So, that we form an interface. Now, this interface also plays an important role when defining the efficiency of the perovskite solar cell. Now, we have learned that although the efficiency of the perovskite solar cell is very high there are two important problems needs to be solved in this case. One is the toxicity due to the lead and second is the stability. We have shown you about the golden triangle and we have, we have talked about that whenever you want to bring about any technology for example, like photovoltaic technology in the market the three parameters has to be simultaneously optimized. One is its efficiency, second is its cost and third is the lifetime or the stability. If the efficiency is very high cost is very low, but the lifetime is not as promising then that is not a good news. Perovskite solar cell has a comparable efficiency like so like a silicon solar cell 23 percent. It cost is almost half sometimes one third or one fourth than the silicon technology when you talk about roll to roll production, but it lifetimes is very very limited in comparison to the silicon solar cells. Silicon solar panel one install it can run easily 20 to 25 years, but perovskite solar cell can run only one year in its peak efficiency. So, there are a lot of work has to be done to improve the stability of the perovskite solar cell and there are a lot of work is ongoing to improve the stability of the perovskite solar cell. Now, in terms of stability we have seen that there are three major source of instability one is the photo instability which can be attributed to the ion migration, there are thermal instability and there are moisture instability. To prevent that most of the time perovskite solar cell is fabricated in a globe box in a control environment where you can control the oxygen level and humidity level. Oxygen and humidity together they degrade the perovskite into an irreversible products and the 3D structures spontaneously disintegrates into a 2D component structures. Now, the 2D structure is not good for transport of the charge carrier. So, you lose significantly your efficiency. Another important factor is that here there are ions are there organic cations and this organic cations upon the light exposure they spontaneously move or migrate along the crystal structure a phenomenon commonly known as the ion migration. Now, we have seen that by using compositional mapping or by changing the cationic site or by changing the anionic site or by a suitably permutation combination of the cationic and anionic site we not only can tune the band gap, 
but we can also enhance the photostability and the thermal stability. In addition to that to, to prevent the environmental degradation, we put encapsulator barrier layer to protect our solar cell. Still there are a lot of efforts and research is ongoing to make a roll to roll high efficient perovskite solar module. Now in this con context, we have also introduced the idea of the perovskite single crystal. Like all other single crystal, here we expect to have very less number of defect states or trap states and one in ideal case one crystal domain. Now if there is a one crystal domain with a no grain boundary, then the source of the charge recombination gets suppressed and that is expected to increase the short circuit current. We have seen that in terms of the photoluminescence properties, in terms of that steady state and time resolved photoluminescence properties there is a significant difference between the bulk polycrystalline perovskite and single crystal perovskite material. We can calculate and find out the number of trap states and defect states in a perovskite single crystal by doing fluorescence time resolve experiment. We have seen that there are three different methods for growth of the perovskite single crystal from the solution like slow cooling, inverse temperature crystallization and also anti-solvent method. And we have also learned that the crystallization is driven by the supersaturation followed by the nucleation and the crystal growth. And we also discussed that perovskite single crystal because of the its superior optoelectronic properties and less number of defect and trap states is very very useful for not only making solar cell but also for photodetectors, light emitting diodes and lasers. Now there are tremendous amount of research is ongoing on the bulk perovskite. 2D quasi perovskite or 2D 3D quasi perovskite, double perovskite solar cell, perovskite single crystal and perovskite silicon tandem solar cell to bring this technology commercially available for everyone. So this is a very important upcoming technology and lot of people are therefore working on this technology and those days are not very far, we will have a perovskite high efficiency stable perovskite module in the market. Now there are a lot of excellent research papers and reviews on the perovskite solar cell you will find online like uh, for the single crystal you can look at the references like you know this Liu Yu Cheng et al recent progress in single crystal perovskite research including crystal preparation, property evaluation and application and the recent progress in the single crystal perovskite research including crystal preparation property and evaluation by Y Liu. So, apart from these two references also there are lot of research papers and review papers available in the literature on the perovskite single crystal and as a whole on the perovskite materials and you can get an in-depth idea and understanding about that. So uh, I hope that this perovskite solar cell you have uh, learnt and enjoyed this technology and we need to do lot of work still to make this solar cell technology a commercially viable, viable technology. Thank you very much for your attention.